All right, last week we started in Romans, and uh, we, we, we just did some introductory things. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, just some basic things like who wrote the book of Romans, and we, uh, we said Paul was the writer. Paul, who had been previously named Saul, was the writer of Romans, and uh, he, he was the author. Now, the writer was actually, he had a, he had a scribe, a secretary, whose name was Tertius, and uh, we talked about who carried the letter, that the letter was carried by a woman who Paul identifies as Sister Phoebe, and uh, she carried the letter in circular fashion to different, different churches until it finally would have made its way to Rome. We talked about some of the, uh, some of the overwhelming themes of, of Romans, and that's really where we're going to begin tonight is start diving into some of those. But I did want to just jump back because a couple of you have asked me in week one under the, the heading about halfway down on the first page, so it would be on page three of your handout, what the blank is for, for when Paul met Christ. Paul met Christ about A.D. 35. Uh, <clears throat> so it was, it's believed that about somewhere between um, five to seven years after Christ was crucified is when Paul had his Saul had his Damascus Road experience and then had his had his uh, his life changed and became known as Paul. So about AD 35 would have been uh, around that time. Paul Paul would have been around 30 uh, 30 years old or so um, at that point, and it's believed that he lived to be about 60 years old. So he he was uh, roughly midway middle of his life whenever he met Christ. And remember, up until that time, he had been uh, educated. He was, he was very educated in Roman customs and ways. And so he was, uh, he was a Pharisee. And uh, he, was, he was one that uh, was, again, very well-versed in the ways of uh, the, the Jewish faith and culture. And so that's why he has so much knowledge. When you read Romans, you, you, you pick up on that. He has a lot of knowledge about the Jewish faith and culture, and he, he engages with that quite a bit, and that's, that's the reason why. But we talked last week about the three overwhelming themes of Romans, and that's also on the, the page three. Whoa. We got it. Okay. All right. Can you hear me now? Okay. Ooh, I can hear myself, too. Um, we said the righteousness of God. That was the first overwhelming theme. Uh, second is the grace of Christ. And then the third overwhelming theme is the power of the gospel. We're going to really hit tonight with the righteousness of God as we continue on into chapter 1. And, uh, and, and just talk about what that means because really the, the theme of what we're going to deal with tonight is this idea of the righteous God and what what that means of, of, a, of an attribute of God and how, uh, how Paul makes the case that we can recognize that and how we should recognize that. So we're going to begin tonight on page five of your handout. And if you didn't get everything from last week, uh, there's a, a couple of ways that you can, you can go back and fill in the blanks. You could just borrow from someone close to you. Um, you could... Also, the, it, last week is on YouTube. You can go back and take a look at that. Uh, so it's on our church YouTube channel. Uh, it's just podcast style. You're not going to see any video there, but you just just hear the hear the lesson. And then, as we get probably probably past tonight uh, in future weeks, I'll make the first couple of weeks available. Just a few copies here and there. That if you if you missed, you can just go and grab it and uh, and get what you need. Um, but those are the ways that, that I don't have that for week one tonight, but I'll, I'll make that available probably starting next week for weeks one and two if you, if you need something to fill in. Well, let's, uh, let's begin tonight before we start looking at uh, chapter one. Let's start with prayer, and uh, let's just ask God's blessing on our time tonight. And uh, also, while, you're, while we're praying tonight, let's, let's pray about um, the... Uh, prayer conference. It's going to be here tomorrow night and Friday night. And uh, of course, Pastor Chad has mentioned this from the stage on Sundays. He's talked about this a couple of times. Uh, but tomorrow and Friday night and then also Friday morning uh, is our Church of God for Virginia State Prayer Conference. All the churches of God in Virginia, about 200 or so of them, uh, 
pastors that are able to, not all of them can, but pastors that are able to from those churches will come to Winchester uh, beginning tomorrow morning, and uh, they'll, be, they'll be here for a couple of days. And tomorrow night at 7 is, is the first worship service. And uh, the, the general overseer, the gen general uh, bishop of the, of the Church of God for, for all the Church of God International will be here tomorrow night preaching. He's, he's been here before. He was here uh, at the 40th anniversary celebration. Tim Hill is his name. He was here uh, for Pastor Pauline's 40th anniversary uh, a year ago this past October. And so he'll be here uh, tomorrow night preaching, and then uh, Friday morning and Friday night, uh, the speaker is a, is a man by the name of, of Kip Box, and he is uh, an administrative bishop in the western half of North Carolina, and he'll be preaching both of those nights. But Friday night at 6.30 is the induction for uh, Darren and Pauline Waller into the Hall of Prophets. So that begins at 6.30. It's a the service, the church service itself begins at 7, but they'll, they'll open up for us uh, at 6.30 in the sanctuary for that. And uh, it's about a 25-30 about a minute ceremony, and, and then we'll go right into the worship service after that. So if you at all possible can be here, um, I know that uh, that would mean a lot to, to Daryl and Pauline, and, and it would just mean a lot for them to see many of you and, and to, to have you here and be able to, to at least see you, if not if maybe they wouldn't have the chance necessarily to speak to everyone, but at least to see you and, and know that you're, you're here supporting them. So that will be um, Friday night at 6.30, and then it'll go right into worship after that at 7. So pray about that. There's a lot going on. It's, it's just busy, and uh, just pray that everything goes well and smoothly for uh, all those who are traveling and for those who are, who are coming into town that they would have traveling mercies. So uh, let's, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight and uh, just, just, again, ask his blessing on that and our time to, together. Father, we thank you tonight that we can come into your house. We thank you, Lord, for all of your blessings. We thank you for what you've done for us today, the things that we can, we can look at and, re and remember and recall that you did for us. But, Lord, the many, many things that we don't even realize that were blessings that you sent our way. You're just such a you're such a good God, and we we are so grateful for all of your mercy and love to us each and every day. And I pray tonight that as we begin our Bible study, that you would just come and be the teacher among us. That you would just open our hearts and minds to hear, to receive, to grow, to learn, uh, to become better disciples of you. I pray that God, you would you would just enlighten us to something uh, that that maybe we've never thought of before, or seen before, or some something about your character that just. Uh, causes our faith to deepen and grow. And Lord, we just pray for uh, this prayer conference that's happening over the next couple of days. Lord, the, the, the many who will be traveling to this area, we, we just pray that you would uh, cover them in your protection and your grace. God, those who will be coming from, from churches and congregations where maybe they're discouraged and they just feel like, like nothing is working and nothing's going well, I just pray that this would be a couple of days of rest and uh, re rejuvenation and that, Lord, you would just speak to them and, and cause them to see you and, and to see your, your help in their lives and in their ministries. And, God, we just pray that you would uh, be with every need that's represented in, in this room tonight, Lord, every need that's represented in our church and throughout our congregation. Lord, we give them all to you, and we just ask for your help and grace and your healing and your direction. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, Romans chapter 1. We're going to begin in verse 18. I'm going to be switching back and forth a little bit between different versions of the Scripture tonight. Um, typically, when I, when I teach, I, I use the New King James Version. I am going to use that tonight, but I'm also going to read a couple of places here and there from the New Living Translation, just because I think sometimes the language is a little bit simpler to understand in a, in a translation like the New Living Translation or the Amplified or the Message or, or something uh, of, that, of that nature. But when we started last week, we read and we worked through Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. And most of that was Paul's introduction to the letter. He was, he was giving his greeting. He was saying who he was. He was giving his credentials. He was talking about how he wanted 
he has a desire and a willingness and a readiness to go to Rome and to visit. He talks about uh, why he wants to go there, that he, he wants to hear about their faith. He wants to hear about the things that God is doing among them. He wants to impart to them knowledge that he has that maybe they don't have yet. And then he gets into verse 16. Uh, he's just said, I really want to make it to Rome to teach and to preach. And then he says in verse 16 that, that, that great one-liner that we get from Romans, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And I told you that Romans is full of uh, New Testament one-liners, things that we just hear and that we can quote. And maybe we don't always know the full context or where it comes from, but we can at least uh, recognize it by, by what it says. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God of salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also for the Greek, he begins very early in the letter making the case that the gospel of Jesus Christ has the power to change everyone. Up until this point, Paul is dealing with a belief, he's dealing with um, an, an attitude, he's dealing with uh, a, a prejudice really that says that the gospel was only for the Jews, that it was only the Jewish people who Christ had come for, that it was only them who he had come to save and redeem. And, and Paul begins, because God has revealed it to him, Paul begins to, to kind of turn this narrative around a little bit, that the gospel is for everyone. He says, first for the Jew and also for the Greek. It doesn't mean that, it's, that the, the, the Jewish are first in line. It just means that they were the first to receive. They were the initial ones to receive, and then it transfers also for the Greek, which is also a way of saying the Gentile, and anyone who is not Jewish. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. In the gospel, he says, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. It is transferable to understand the righteousness of God. It is transferable for the one who was born in the Jewish faith to understand that God is righteous in the context of the Jewish faith. And that same concept of righteousness transfers over when a person meets Christ. The righteousness of God is the same from faith to faith. A person who's born without faith, we're getting ready to talk about that tonight, but a person who's born without faith or has no faith upbringing, there's still a sense of righteousness that exists a sense of what is right and how to be in right standing. And it's revealed from faith to faith. So, so Paul is laying the standard out in verse 17 that righteousness, the, the, the revealed righteous nature of God, is something that is apparent to all people. And then he says, as, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And there's another one of those famous one-liners that, that we, we come to it by faith. That we all believe in something. There is something that every person believes in. And it's, it's, at its core is this desire, this longing of the human heart to connect and to contact the righteous nature of God. And that's what we're going we're gonna to talk about tonight. So when we get to verse 18, this is what Paul says. I'm going to read it first from the New Living. And then we'll, we'll fill some holes in back with the, the New King James. But he says in verse 18, But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Now, the New King James says that he, he uses the phrase, the wrath of God. The wrath of God. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and, and the unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Then he says in verse 19, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. 
because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were, thank, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. We're going to stop there. We're going to unpack these few verses of Scripture. Paul really doesn't waste any time, does he? He says, hello, I'm, I'm here. I want to come see you. Now let me talk to you about how angry God is. That's a way to kind of invite yourself to a place, right? And I want to come in and tell you how angry God is. He begins his, his letter really by talking about this, this concept of the wrath of God. Now, we hear this term, the wrath of God. We, we, we hear people throw it around. But what is the wrath of God? What does that really mean? Wrath, of course, means anger. Uh, wrath is, is, when we think of wrath, we think of somebody who's, who's full of wrath. We think of a person who's angry to a point where there's really no control. Angry to a point where there is no, uh, there's no rationale, there's no reasoning behind what's, what happens. And this, this, this terminology for wrath of God gets thrown around oftentimes when we see things like natural disasters. We see hurricanes or we see earthquakes or we see uh, volcanic eruptions or something like that that come in and they just... They just wreak havoc on a place, and they, they wreak havoc on people, and people are injured and killed, and, and lives are ruined and turned up, upside down, and people say, oh, that's the wrath of God. That's, that's God's, God's wrath right there. God is, is unleashing his anger. And, and that could be true when we read certain parts of Scripture, especially if you read about the wrath of God in a future tense. If you read like the book of Revelation, for instance, you'll find that there are, there are examples where the wrath of God will be poured out in that kind of way through natural disasters, through, through things that, that do cause destruction and wreak havoc on the earth. That, that is, a, is a, a, a form of the manifest wrath of God. But what does the wrath of God really mean? And can we really look at every event that happens in the world that's bad and rightly claim that that is the wrath of God. Is that an appropriate use of the idea of the wrath of God? So we're going to explore that a little bit. The wrath of God, if you're, if you're looking at the handout, uh, again on page 5, is the righteous personal anger against all sin in the universe. That's what the wrath of God is. It's the righteous personal anger against all sin in the universe. Righteous. What does that word righteous mean? That means we get the word right in there, that you're in the right. We have the right. I have the right. People say, I've got a right to do this. I have a right to do that. It's as if when we, when we think about the wrath of God, it's as if we could say of God, he has the right to, to do what he does. He is right in whatever he does. Now we know this to be true of God. That God is always right. That whatever, whatever God does is, is right and just. The righteous personal anger against all sin. It's righteous, so God is right in what happens. It's personal to him. That sin is a personal a front against God and against the character of God. Not so much that sin, that sin itself has the ability to bother God, but it's sin, sin that goes against the nature of God. It goes against the character of God. It is obnoxious to God. And it's not that God can't handle seeing sin or God can't handle watching someone sin. It's that sin is so contrary to his holy nature that it is obnoxious to him. He has, he has no, no tolerance for sin. Sin doesn't surprise God. Sin doesn't, doesn't take God to, to this place where he, he, he just throws his hands up and says, I can't believe they're doing that. God knows that there's sin. God sees it. God has seen sin since the foundation of the world. God has seen sin since the very first sin. He knew about it then, and he's known about all of it since. 
but it's personal to him because it violates who he is. It violates his character. It violates his holy nature. And it's his anger against all sin in the universe. All sin, wherever it is, whatever form it is, whatever it looks like. That's the wrath of God. It's the righteous. He has the right to be this way. Personal, it's against his character. Anger against all sin. That is what the wrath of God means. And there's a couple of things about the wrath of God that we need to understand. The first one is, is that it can be kindled. It can be set ablaze. The wrath of God can be set ablaze. And again, this isn't to say that God is irrational or that God is, uh, is, is just kind of goes off on tangents or God goes into a warpath mode. That's not what it means at all. But it, it does, it does, the scripture does indicate to us that the wrath of God can be kindled, that there comes a point, there have, there have come points in the scripture where God has said, you know, enough is enough. Think about all the way back in the book of Genesis where, where, where God looked down at man and he said, you know, it's just, it's just enough. I'm going to do something about this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna just, just going to wipe and eradicate sin off the face of the earth. And those who are found righteous, those who, who are doing right, I'll, I'll provide a way of escape for them. And so God sends, sends uh, the instructions to Noah. Noah begins to preach and to build, and they build the ark. And uh, when, when it's all completed and Noah has, has completed his work and he's completed preaching and, and has tried to persuade as many as he can to get into the ark, he sends all the animals, he sends Noah and his family into the ark, and he sends this great flood. It was the, the, the wrath of God on the earth. It was the righteous personal anger of God that manifest on the earth and mankind was almost completely wiped out. It can be kindled. But then notice what it says in Genesis, Genesis chapter 6, that God was grieved by this. God did not find pleasure in this wiping out of the, the earth. God found no, no pleasure in that. He was grieved. He was sorry that he had done that. So the wrath of God can be, it can be kindled, it can be fed. We read in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 15 that God is a jealous God, that God has, has, has that we, we think of that word jealousy and it's, it's always in a bad connotation, but what it means in, in the scriptural sense when we say that God is, is a jealous God is that it, it means that he has, no, he has no rival, he has no equal, and he will not stand to have a rival or an equal. That there is none who is like our God, and any, any thought or any possibility that someone might entertain that they're going to become like God is met with his righteous personal anger, the wrath of God. The wrath of God is future. We read about it in Revelation, that there are future things that are coming. The wrath of God is sometimes present. There are things, I believe, at times that we see that are, are an indication of God's righteous personal anger against sin. But the, the wrath of God, the best news for us, is that the wrath of God can be satisfied. The wrath of God can be, can be quelled, and it's quelled through Christ. It's quelled through the, through the blood of Jesus Christ. If we just turn over just a few pages to Romans chapter 8, we'll just see where, where, where Paul points this out. He says in Romans chapter 8, verse 3, that what the law could not do, where man tries to make laws against sin, what the law could not do because it was weak in the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. The law couldn't do it, but Christ could. The wrath of God was satisfied in and through Christ Jesus. So when we think about this idea of the wrath of God, it's more than just, just saying, well, you know, there's an earthquake in, in another part of the world. God must be angry again. God must really be angry at those people. There's another hurricane down in wherever. God must really be angry with them. 
Well, you know as well as I do, there's places that don't experience those kinds of things. We don't have hurricanes here like that. We don't have, uh, we don't have debilitating fires, wildfires. Not to say we could never have those things here, but we, we haven't historically. We can't even get it to snow two inches. <laughs> are we to believe that God doesn't have, that, are we to believe that there's no one who lives where we are that, that doesn't sin? Are we to believe that, 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 that the sin of the people who live around us, sometimes even our own sin, is, is so light in comparison to where it is in other places that God just looks the other way? Of course not. So to pinpoint everything as the wrath of God is, is, is false. It's, it's a false use of, of this idea of God's wrath. Some things happen in the world because uh, people live by the ocean and, and prevailing winds blow, blow storms and moisture their way and they develop into hurricanes. Some people experience natural disasters because they live on a fault line or near a fault line. And sometimes those plates, they begin to, to, to come together and they hit together and that causes an earthquake. Some people experience natural disasters because they live in a place that's prone to tornadoes and the, the, the geography of that place, you see all of this, all of this has, has an explanation. But to say, as sometimes Christians often do, that everything that happens is the wrath of God makes no sense. And how about this? How about the, the effect of, the, of, of, if that's true, the wrath of God on the innocent? Is God so angry that he, he doesn't care who, who gets hurt? If he's, if he's angry about sin, then why wouldn't the, the, the tornado hit the, the, the bars and the casinos and the, you know, all the places where those kinds of things happen? Why does it hit sometimes where there are young children? See, the argument doesn't hold up, but the, the understanding of the wrath of God doesn't change. It's the righteous personal anger of God against all sin. So Paul says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and the unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. What Paul is saying is that inside the heart and the mind of man is this knowledge that not everything we're doing is right with God. That not everything that we do is pleasing to God. Inside the heart, in the mind of every person, is this clear understanding that there is a day of reckoning that will be coming. Why is it that we all understand that, whether we're saved or not, whether we, we live for the Lord or whether we don't? Why is it that people understand that? Because God... God answers that in his word. He says that he has put eternity in our hearts. That we understand that what happens on this earth is not all there is to life. That there's more to it. And we understand that there are, there are, there are possibilities beyond what we see in front of us. It's in the heart of every person. The eternity is in the heart of every, every man and woman. And so he says that God has revealed this to us from heaven just in, in the, the very act of creating us. Because what may, what may be known of God is manifest in them. There it is, that idea of God manifesting himself through us, putting eternity in our hearts. For God has shown it to them, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. Now, Paul makes it an aim here, and we're going we're gonna to see this as we carry on, to always present the gospel in the balance of the wrath of God. That there is the wrath of God. It does exist. There is payment and, and punishment for sin, but there's also the hope of the gospel. There's also the hope of Christ. We don't hear this very often, we don't, we don't hear it this, this way very often, any, anymore at least. And 
it would it would come out and, and some of you probably can can remember this from from younger days or from your childhood that when when you went to church you would hear preachers talk about heaven and hell they would say those two things together that there's a there's a place for those who are who are righteous and redeemed and there's a place for those who aren't we don't we don't hear that too often in in the modern church and i'm just i'm not talking about our our church i'm just talking about the church in general it's kind of this idea that you know if you're just you just kind of do the best you can and and you're going to make it you're going to make it to the good place and everybody's going to be happy and you're going to see everybody there and and the world has this idea that everybody's going to heaven but the scripture says that's not true there are two eternal realities there are two eternal futures there is a place reserved for those laid up for those prepared for those who have made christ their own and there's a place for those who have not we believe in two eternal futures and paul makes the case that there's the wrath of god but there's the there's the antidote to the wrath of god which is the gospel of jesus christ and the choice is ours god's anger his wrath is kindled or or, or fueled against unrighteousness because unrighteousness requires a lie in order to live to live an unrighteous life requires that we live in denial about what we have had placed in our heart by the one who created us god has placed eternity in our hearts we know that there's a we know that there's an eternal future ahead of us and to, to ignore that is to live a lie and to deceive ourselves and say, well, that's not really true. It's unrighteousness that causes people to hold a distorted view of who God is because righteous living requires that we repent. Righteous living requires that we repent. It requires that we have humility. It requires that we rely upon the Lord. It requires that we allow ourselves to be born again into new life. Righteous living, to acknowledge the truth of God, to live, to live in God's righteousness, requires that we turn away from the things that this flesh wants to do. That we do instead, we become, as Paul said, I'm a bondservant to Jesus Christ. We become slaves not to the sin of the world, but we become slaves to who he is. And so Paul says this is why, the un this is why God's wrath is, is revealed and why it's carried out on the unrighteous. So how do we know that God exists? He says in verse 19, because what may, what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. How do we know that God exists? God reveals to us our spiritual nature. God has revealed to us our spiritual nature. He says in, in Genesis, let us make man in our image. We are made in the image of, of God. That means that we have an eternal piece of us. And, and that's what, that's what the, the scripture then says, that God has placed that in our hearts. That we know that there is an eternal part to us we know that our lives are eternal now don't don't miss this and for for those of you like like myself who who have have been in church your entire life or even if you've just been in church a very long time we tend to forget this that when we're not living for the lord there's still this ache inside of us that causes us to, to to know that something's not right what is that it's that void of the human heart it's that 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 void that can only be filled by god it can only be filled by christ and if if you if you're not living for the lord or or if you just remember to when you weren't living for the lord you 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 recall that that we try to fill that with anything and everything that we possibly can we fill it with with things of the world and things of the flesh and we we try to we try to do everything we can to to make that void go away but it won't go away because god placed it there 
And God placed it there so that the only thing, the only thing that can fill it is him. The only thing that can make that void be, be full and complete is him. God has revealed this to us in our spiritual nature. He said, let us make man in our image. We're made in the image of God, so therefore we have that, we have that void. God reveals to us his existence through nature. Nature reveals to us the existence of God. Psalm 19 and 1 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. You can, you can see, the, you can see the, the existence of God in, in nature and in, in the things that God has created. Now, Scientists will tell you that it all happened with the Big Bang. That it all just, one day it just all came together at the right time and there it is. We have this Big Bang and they call it the Big Bang Theory. Well, you know, I'm not going to try to argue with a scientist because that's kind of futile. But we know what the scripture says, that God created that God said, let there be, and there was. And we have to accept it by faith. And if there was a Big Bang, somebody had, to, somebody had to make it happen. And God was the one who did that, if, if, if that was the way. I don't, I don't believe that's the way it happened. I believe God spoke and bang, it happened. That's how I think it happened. But, but God has revealed himself through creation. The order of creation, the pattern of creation, the, the planning, the systemic nature of creation. God reveals his existence through nature. The heavens, again, the heavens declare the glory of God. We were, we were uh, looking at the sky on the way to church tonight, and it was just getting dark, and you can see there's, there's two planets up here in a perfect line. And uh, some, some nights you can see those things and some nights you can't. And then we saw another thing out here and we thought that was another one. It was an airplane. But, <laughs> but uh, anyway, two planets in a line and, and the things that you can see out, out in the night sky and the, the, the way that the, the, the mountains and, the, and the, the, the land come together, the patterns of the ocean, it all reveals the nature of God. God reveals to us his invisible qualities through visible nature. Again, what we can see, the patterns, the order, the seasons, the beauty of it all. God is revealing to us his invisible qualities. And so Paul says that the unrighteous have had it revealed to them from heaven that to deny the existence of God requires a lie because the invisible attributes of God are clearly seen in this world around us so that they are without excuse. So that they're without excuse. Now what does that mean? That means that the idea of atheism or the idea of being agnostic or saying that God doesn't exist is blown completely out of the water by God's Word. God's Word cancels atheism. God's Word cancels the idea of being agnostic. There is no excuse for a person to say, I don't believe in God. Because God has revealed himself to this point through nature and through our spiritual nature. He says that they are without excuse because, verse 21, although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were, were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were dark. And this is the tragedy of man. That there are, there are those who have denied God and who continue to deny God. And Paul says they really have no excuse. There's no reason for that. The tragedy of man is... That first of all, he knows God. That's the first, and that's not tragic in itself, but when you look at all this together, the first part of it is that he knows God. And, and Paul's just explained it that through, the, through the, the, the natural world and through the spiritual nature having been revealed, that, that man knows that God exists. That's the first part of the tragedy of man, that man, that he knows God. Now, what happens to those who 
live in places or those who live in cultures that have never heard of Christ or never heard of the gospel. Um, they, they, they've never heard of, of, of who God is. What happens to them? Are they, are they then uh, just cast aside? Does God judge them the same way? And, and I would say the answer is no, that if there are people, and there are very few people groups in the world today, but there, there have been in the past, if there are people in the world who have never heard of God and have never had the opportunity to hear of God and have never heard of Christ, you will find that typically most people groups or almost every people group is aiming for something. They're looking to something as bigger than themselves. I think about the Native Americans on this continent before, before uh, the, the Europeans came and before they, they were colonized and they, they, they heard or had the opportunity to hear the gospel. What were they doing? They were, they were seeking after something bigger than themselves through nature. And they were, they were creating rituals and worship that involved nature. Now, does God look at that and say, well, those people are just worshiping a lie who had never had the opportunity to hear? No, God says, look, I have revealed myself to them and through them, through their spiritual nature. They know there's something bigger. I'm revealing myself through nature. And they're seeing that, but yet they've never had the opportunity to hear about Christ. They've never had the opportunity to hear about the Lord. So even those who have never heard about Christ know of God. They have this knowledge of, of the existence of God. But the second part of the tragedy is that he does not glorify God. This is an acknowledgment of God's work and hand in the created world that, that when man doesn't glorify God or when man just says you know all of this is, is by chance it's all of this all of this just kind of happened it just can't kind of came together in a big bang I'm not going to give credit to God for this I'm not going to say that God created this world it just happened that way that's what Paul's talking about this this unwillingness to glorify God and say you know God is behind this the third part is that of the tragedy of man he's not thankful to God has no idea of, of being thankful to God. He's confused in his thinking about God. Thinking that God is, is, is out to get him or thinking that God is just there to, to give me, give me, give me. And that's what God is all about. And then the last part of it he says is that his heart is shattered. His heart, his heart was darkened. His heart is shadowed by his own incapacity to see God. This is the tragedy of man. And then he talks about the futility of man. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. So man says, you know, I'm not going to acknowledge that God exists. I'm just going to put it out of my mind. I'm, going to, I'm, I'm not going to glorify him. I'm not going to be thankful. I'm, my heart's going to become darkened, and I'm going to become wise in my own eyes. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to, I'm going to take the reins of my own life and do it my way. And I'm going to create for myself my own image, my own version of God. And as man rejects God, he gives up to greater immorality. And greater destruction. Sin is progressive. It takes you deeper. It takes you further and further and, and spirals down into, into deeper and deeper depravity. That's what sin does. So that Paul then says, beginning in verse, in verse 24, Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the, cre the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. And then he says, For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. 
Even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, buried, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which is due. Paul deals with now what really is the topic of, of the world today. This is written almost 2,000 years ago. Rome was known to be a city full of all types of sexual sin, all types of sexual abomination, and, and homosexuality was one of those. Let's be clear tonight in what we know from the scripture that according to the book of Leviticus chapter 18 and, verse, and, and the book of Leviticus chapter 20 that homosexuality is an abomination to God. That means that when, when, God, when, when God considers the sin of hom homosexuality that it is is, is great to this point that it is it is not greater than other sins but it is to the point that a person who is in that sin is almost at the point where they're beyond return that's what that means that's what that word when you look at that word abomination doesn't mean that God looks at it and says well this is worse than that what it means is that God has a recognition that that sin is just a few steps away from being without return because of that person's choice, not because of God's will, but because of that person's choice. Now, who decided this? We, we don't decide this. We, we can't sit down and decide that this is an abomination. God decided this. God said this is an abomination. And Paul paints, paints this idea in verses 26 and 27 that homosexuality is like a final phase in the ultimate rebellion against God. Again, just a few steps away from complete and total rebellion against God. He says in verse 28 that God gives them up, uh, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind. Debased mind. A debased mind means depraved perverted, that God gives them up to a debased mind, that God, that, that there comes a point in which God, with any sin, will say to you and me, it doesn't matter what the sin is, that God will say to you and me, okay, I'm, I've, I've done all that I can do, now I'm just going to turn it over and let the natural consequence of sin come to you. Every sin has consequence. Every sin has, has a natural consequence that comes to us. If, if we talk about, if we, if we substitute what's here for something else, let's say we talk about the sin of, we'll pick on one of the seven sins of the, of the church, the, the Catholic church, gluttony, okay? Let's just say that, that that's the sin. And, and we just, gluttony is when you just eat until, I don't. I can't really explain it because I don't. I don't know that I've ever done it. I'm not saying that to say that I'm better than anybody else, but I just can't eat that much. But you just eat and eat and eat and eat, and then you you eat and eat and eat, and it becomes it becomes that the problem isn't that you're hungry; it's that you're trying to fill that void in your life with food. And Gluttony becomes the thing that you rely on. It becomes the food. The food becomes the thing that you that you rely on. And where was I going with that? <laughs> I distracted myself. The react. Oh, got it. The natural consequence of that is that your health is going to decline. You're going to experience health difficulties and, and problems and, and perhaps even a very serious nature. 
And, and God will allow that to happen. He will allow the natural consequence of sin to come. And he's saying here in verse 28 that when it comes to homosexuality, that God gives, gives up to a debased or a, de a depraved or perverted mind. It's reduced in value. If, if a ruler or a, or a government was to debase its currency, they would reduce its value. It would become reduced in value. The use of the term here suggests that people are no longer people at some point, but more they're, they're acting more like animals. Their mental faculties become reduced or diminished because they're so engrossed in their sin and so engrossed in the thing that has taken them far away from God. Essentially, it's God's way of saying, I'm going to give you what you want and what you think you need, and you're just going to have to deal with the consequences of it. So Paul says that he gives them up to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetous, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud boasters, inventors of evil things disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God and those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Now, before you think that Paul was going to pick on homosexuality as the one sin that he was going to harp on, he just gave us a list a full list, a big list, a weighty, heavy list. He says, those who are practicing these things are ignoring the righteousness of God. They're ignoring the righteous sense of God. Now again, Paul has said hello. He said, my name is Paul. I want to come visit you. And then he says, all right, let's talk about all these ugly sins. If you're in Rome, you're listening to this, you're thinking, I don't know if I want this guy to come see me or not. He, he, he might not be the best ambassador to come and see us. But he's making a case, and he's, he's laying out a foundation of, of the Christian faith. Then he says in ver uh, chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore you are inexcusable. Whoever you are, whoever you are who judge, for in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. Now he's saying that sin is ugly. No matter who does it, no matter where it occurs or what it looks like, that sin is all ugly. It all takes us away from God. It says, but we know, verse 2, that the judgment of God is according to the truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, old man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? He's saying that we're all, we're all on the hook for this. We're all on the hook for this. We're all, we're all just messed up a little bit. Then he says, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? There's probably my favorite one-liner of Romans, that the goodness of God leads us to repentance. That's good news. That's good news for all of us, that the goodness of God leads us to repentance. If it wasn't for the goodness of God, then we wouldn't have that opportunity to repent. But God's goodness affords us time and opportunity to make things right. That's where we're living right now. We're living in, in a time where God's goodness can be revealed through the people of God. It can be revealed through His church. It can be revealed through the body of Christ. And the very purpose of God revealing his goodness through us is to give time and opportunity for those who are living in sin to come to righteousness. If it weren't for his goodness, 
if it weren't for his grace and his forbearance and his long suffering, as it says there, then at the very moment that we sinned, the first time, God would have said, nope, not having it. And he would have wiped us away and cast us away. <coughs> but his goodness, his goodness leads us to repentance. His goodness gives us the time that we need and the opportunity to hear the gospel and the opportunity to, to let it work on our hearts to make things right. Thank God for his goodness. There's, there, there's, there's nothing that we can do that can, can, can bring ourselves righteousness. It's through God's goodness and through his righteousness alone that we can come to repentance and to salvation. We're going to stop here tonight. I'm going to make a note that we need to pick up here next week to finish, uh, to finish out this, this section tonight. But we're going to stop there and end on a high note. You know, we could have stopped and ended on the, the last part of chapter 1. That's kind of a low point. But we're going to end on this. God is good. And His goodness leads us to repentance. His goodness brings us to that point where we can become righteous. Stand with me if you would, please. Thank you so much for being here tonight. As you, as you leave, uh, if you've come ready to worship in giving, the tower is right over here to my left, out, out this door right here. You can, you can drop your gift there. And we just, uh, as always, thank you for your, your stewardship. But let's pray as we go and, uh, and just ask God's blessing as we leave. Father, we thank you again for your word tonight. We thank you for what we can learn from it. Lord, we, we leave tonight thankful for your goodness. If it weren't for your goodness, none of us would be here. If it weren't for your goodness, none of us could, could stand, none of us could, could have any hope of righteousness. But because of your goodness, we have the opportunity to live a changed life, to live a life that is redeemed and, and, and settled in you. And we just thank you for that. And I pray that that knowledge would go with us and that you would help us to share that goodness with someone else. Lord, keep us as we go. Protect us and watch over us. Bring us back here uh, either tomorrow night or Friday night or Sunday, ready to worship you and to give you our very best, we pray. In Christ's name, amen.